The House of the Scorpion by Nancy Farmer Chapter 1 In the Beginning In the beginning there were 36 of them, 36 droplets of life so tiny that Eduardo could see them only under a microscope. He studied them anxiously in the darkened room. Water bubbled through tubes that snaked around the warm, humid walls. Air was sucked into growth chambers. A dull red light shone on the faces of the workers as they watched their own arrays of little glass dishes. Each one contained a drop of life. Eduardo moved his dishes one after the other under the lens of the microscope. The cells were perfect, or so it seemed. Each was furnished with all it needed to grow. So much knowledge was hidden in that tiny world. Even Eduardo, who understood the process very well, was awed. The cell already understood what color hair it was to have, how tall it would become, and even whether it preferred spinach to broccoli. It might even have a hazy desire for music or crossword puzzles. All that was hidden in the droplet. Finally, the round outlines quivered and lines appeared, dividing the cells into two. Eduardo sighed. It was going to be all all right. He watched the samples grow and then he carefully moved them to the incubator. But it wasn't all right. Something about the food, the heat, the light was wrong, and the man didn't know what it was. Very quickly, over half of them died. There were only 15 now, and Eduardo felt a cold lump in his stomach. If he failed, he would be sent to the farms, and then what would become of Anna and the children, and his father, who was so old, it's okay, said Lisa, so close by that. Eduardo jumped. She was one of the senior technicians. She had worked for so many years in the dark. Her face was chalk white and her blue veins were visible through her skin. How can it be okay, Eduardo said. The cells were frozen over a hundred years ago. They can't be as healthy as samples taken yesterday. That long? The man marveled. But some of them should grow, Lisa said sternly. So, Eduardo began to worry again. And for a month, everything went well. The day came when he implanted the tiny embryos in the brood, cows. The cows were lined up, patiently waiting. They were fed by tubes and their bodies were exercised by giant men metal arms that grasped their legs and flexed them as though the cows were walking through an endless field. Now and then, an animal moved its jaw in an attempt to chew cod. Did they dream of dandelions? Eduardo wondered. Did they feel a phantom wind blow in tall grass against their legs? Their brains were filled with quiet joy from implants in their skulls. Were they aware of the children growing in their wombs? Perhaps the cows hated what had been done to them because they certainly rejected the embryos. One after another, the infants, at this point no larger than minnows, died. Until there was only one. Eduardo slept badly at night. He cried out in his sleep, and Anna asked what was the matter. He couldn't tell her. He couldn't say that if this last embryo died, he would be stripped of his job. He would be sent to the farms, and she, Anna, and their children, and his father would be cast out to walk the hot, dusty roads. But that one embryo grew until it was clearly a bean with arms and legs, and a sweet dreaming face. Eduardo watched it through scanners. You hold my life in your hands, he told the infant. 
as though it could hear the infant flexed its tiny body in the womb until it was turned toward the man. And Eduardo felt an unreasoning stare of affection. When the day came, Eduardo received the newborn into his hands as though it were his own child. His eyes blurred as he laid it in a crib and reached for the needle that would blunt its intelligence. Don't fix that one, said Lisa, hastily catching his arm. It's a Matteo Alcran, Alacran. They're always left intact. Have I done you a favor? Thought Eduardo as he watched the baby turn his head toward the bustling nurses in their starched white uniforms. Will you thank me for it later?